All right, welcome again to Discovery Church. Come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. <laughs> to everyone joining us outdoors in our courtyard or the porch or online, we're so excited you're here. Join us for the ride. This is part six of this series called Come Holy Spirit. We're inviting the Holy Spirit into our life more deeply and becoming more aware of who he is and how he wants to operate in our life. Let's say the title of this series one more time. Come on, one, two, three. Come, Holy Spirit. I hope that's becoming more comfortable for you to invite the Holy Spirit into your life. We began this series, we might have hesitated in our language or maybe not even know what we're saying when we're inviting the Holy Spirit to come. But I'm hoping you're getting closer and closer and developing a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you miss any of these messages, catch up online, because today we're going to be talking about simple title, spiritual gifts. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're gifted. Come on, tell them. You're gifted. Mama was right. You special. You special. Okay? So, so um, I want to explain. There's a lot of confusion around spiritual gifts, so I'm going to explain the theology of it, read a lot of scriptures, even look at some of the gifts listed in the Bible, explain some of those, and then we'll get really practical. Let me start very importantly, though, with a key scripture that, that it really is important to like this New Testament living. Some of y'all, your Bible is divided into two stories, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. On the New Covenant side, we have a, a, a covenant of grace in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that is available to us. And this is a key verse to understand who you are in Christ. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Look at this with me. It says, but you are, and he's talking to you there, is everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who is a follower, a disciple of Jesus, who's a son of God. You are a chosen people, and look what he calls you, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness you were in into his wonderful light. Now, you may have heard that verse before or read that verse. I don't know if you understand the, the, the weight and the beauty of it, though, that God actually calls you a royal priesthood. See, in the Old Testament, the old covenant, there was only certain people that were the priests. They were a tribe. The tribe of Levi were the only people who could minister to God on behalf of the people and also minister to people on behalf of God. They were the intermediary of man to God. They were priests, okay, the Levites. That's the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus flipped that thing all around. He called like ordinary people, disciples to himself, these fishermen and tax collectors and just average people that he poured himself into. And after he rose from the grave and what we studied and imparted the Holy Spirit to the believers, he actually made every single person available to be a tribe of Levi. Now write it down like this. Every Christian is... A priest. I don't know if you realize this, but this is your identity in Christ. You are a priest of God. You are called to, to be a royal priesthood. Now, this is, this is how the church started. People filled with the power of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and were being used by God. But somewhere along the way, as this Christianity thing started to grow and develop and become more organized and structured, it just became something that it wasn't meant to be. The, the church started looking more like Old Testament, where there was just certain people who were anointed and given positions, and they were the ones who were like, who would teach and preach and pray, and all of us were the ones who were kind of recipients, and, and, but they were just special people, were the priests, not all of us were. And then, and then around, actually it was 1517, history lesson. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me get some history on you guys. In the year 1517, a man by the name of Martin Luther, who was a priest, a Catholic priest, he, he started what's called the Protestant Reformation. And what he did is he said, look, there's so much that we are doing in, in this Catholic movement, in this church of, of God, that is unbiblical. And one of them, primary ones, was what he called the priesthood of every believer. He said, it's not biblical that some of you are calling yourself priests and hoarding ministry and opportunity from the people of God. Every single person is a priest. Not every person is a pastor, but every person is a priest. If you think about that, why do people go to a priest? When do people go to a priest? 
Well, they go to a priest when they need counsel or advice or when they need to confess sin or, or when, they're, when they're struggling. That's when the, a person will go to a priest. If you are a priest, and you are, listen to me. When someone in your life is struggling with something, the decision they have, have to make, you as a child of God have the authority as a priest of God to stand in that gap with them, open up the scriptures, and explain wisdom to them. You are a priest. When someone in your circle, a friend of yours, is struggling with sin and the shame of that sin, and the enemy is lying to them and isolating them, you as a child of God and a royal priesthood have the authority to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ and grace to them, and after they've repented, to say, your sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. You're a priest. Okay, you, this, is, this is who God has called you to be because you have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is a priest, and he's given you gifts to fulfill his calling on your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. We need to understand a lot about spiritual gifts. Let me help you understand. Because the Apostle Paul says, about spiritual gifts, you guys, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware of how God has gifted you to fulfill the priesthood he has put in your life as a child of God. Because talents, natural talents, they come at birth. Sometimes you're born with some natural talents. But spiritual gifts come when you're born again. Every person who gives their life to Jesus, at that moment you are given the Holy Spirit and he has gifted you with his with his variety of gifts, the Bible says. Let me give you my definition based on the Bible of what a spiritual gift is. It's in your notes. But a spiritual gift, spiritual gifts are special supernatural abilities. Now, they're not natural abilities. A lot of you have natural abilities you were born with, but that is not. Just because you're naturally gifted at something doesn't mean it is a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is a supernatural, meaning it does not come from your genes. It doesn't come from anything natural. It came from heaven. It comes from the Holy Spirit a supernatural ability that God gives to each of his children so that we can connect with one another, be strengthened together, and advance his purposes in the world. Now listen to me. All of hell does not want that to happen in your life. All of hell is against you discovering your gifts and activating them to advance God's purpose on this earth. And that's why this message today it's so important for you to understand spiritual gifts and how you have them operating in your life. And throughout the Bible, there's different, in the New Testament, there's different gifts that are listed. And people have looked at that, the different lifts in the, in the New Testament, and they say, okay, well, there's 22 gifts. Well, I count 25, and I count 27 or 29. And, and honestly, there's um, the gifts that are listed in the New Testament, they're great lists. Don't get me wrong. They're primary giftings, but they're not all inclusive. There is a great, great wide variety of spiritual gifts that God gives to his children. But there is several. Let me give them to you. These aren't in your notes. But let me just show you where the primary locations are in the Bible that spiritual gifts are listed. And I'll even call out a few of them and kind of try to explain it. I'm not going to be able to explain every single one of them. I'll tell you what class you should go to here at Discovery if you want an entire list of the spiritual gifts, their explanation and their definition be given to you. There's a class we teach. I'll tell you what it is in a moment. But let me give you the three sections of the New Testament that kind of list out the major gifts of the Bible. The first one comes from Romans chapter 12, verses six through eight, gives us what, what theologians call the motivational gifts. It's called the motivational gifts. And, and in that list, we see prophecy. And a lot of times, this is a, people confuse what prophecy is. A lot of people think it's foretelling the future, which it can be that, but, but really what prophecy is, it is proclaiming the truth and the will of God. Okay, that's what prophecy is. Sometimes it's proclaiming the truth and will of God about a future event. Sometimes it's proclaiming the truth and will of God about something right now. That's prophecy, okay? That is a gift that God has given to some to proclaim the truth and the will of God. Service is a spiritual gift. Teaching, encouragement, giving is a spiritual gift that some people have to divinely enable by God to be generous. Leading or administration is a supernatural gift. Mercy is a spiritual gift that God has given some and has actually withheld it from a lot of you. No, I'm just kidding. All these, you guys, all these lists, obviously we should all be merciful. We should be encouraging and leading and, and serving. It, it, we're like, we're gonna do these things. 
But what the Bible says is that some people have like an, an anointing on their life that it doesn't come naturally. And actually when they do it, like, like one person may encourage others and it, you know, they're encouraging. But when someone with the gift of encouragement starts to encourage, something is drawn and awakened and comes alive and connects to Jesus through the encouragement of someone who has the gift of encouragement. So it's just, it's just different. There's an anointing on that spiritual gift. That's the motivational gifts. There's another list called the manifestation gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the manifestation gifts. And a lot of times these are the gifts that's thought about when we talk about spiritual gifts. And the reason why they're called manifestation gifts is because they literally do that. They manifest themselves. So if you have a manifestation gift, you don't need to take like a survey to know you have it. It will just manifest, okay? It will be evident that you have these gifts operating in your life. Among the list is the word of wisdom and word of knowledge. A lot of times word of knowledge gets confused with prophecy because it, it, it looks and sounds a lot like it. Word of knowledge is where, where someone will get a revelation of an unknown fact or truth about someone or something. Like there is no way that they would know that, but God has divinely revealed to them a knowledge, okay? This, Jesus actually did this with the woman at the well. Remember the woman at the well? Jesus called out her male and was like, hey, go get your husband. Tell your husband. She's like, I ain't married. He's like, yeah, I know you're not married. Neither the five other guys that you were with, you weren't married. That was a word of knowledge operating through Jesus in that situation. I was actually, um, about six years ago, Pastor Brennan and I were at this this conference where about 3,000 people were at, and this guy who was speaking at this conference had this gift of word of knowledge. And as he was speaking, in the middle of it, he just gets a word for, and he, and he, and he calls someone out of 3,000, and he's like, and he starts telling this person who they're married to, and their kids, and decisions that they've made, and things that are happening, and then starts telling them future things, and it was, and he did that to about five or six people, about, and I was actually one of the people he called out, and stood up, and he started telling me about my wife, and my kids, and, 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 and some things that we just, decisions we just made, and about discovery, and, and things that we were just doing, and, and then he started telling me, and prophesying after he gave word of knowledge, he started telling me things about the future of what discovery would do, and be, and I'm telling you, it's all come to pass. It's all come to pass. That was a word of knowledge operating. A word of wisdom is where you can get heaven's strategy and solution for a particular events or problem that you have. That's a word of wisdom that you can, God can drop that into you, give you wisdom that you wouldn't have. Prophecy, faith, miracles, discernment of spirits is in that list. That's discernment of spirits is where you're made aware of an evil demonic presence. Okay, that's, you're, you discern a demonic presence. Even where outwardly it may not look that way, it may look like an angel of light, they may look a certain way or talk a certain way, but you discern something behind it, a spirit behind that. You see this in operation in the book of Acts when Paul and Apollos were, I believe they were preaching in Philippi, and there was this woman who had the spirit of divination who was following after them, and she was saying, listen to these men, they're proclaiming the truth of the Most High God. And what she's saying is good. What she's saying is accurate. But the Apostle Paul is discerning something behind what she's saying, that there is a spirit of distraction or division or confusion behind what she's saying. Something is off. And the Apostle Paul turns around and rebukes the spirit of divination off of her, and that spirit leaves. That was the spirit of discernment that, that God had given the Apostle Paul. Healing, tongues, and interpretation of tongues are all in this list of manifestational gifts. Next week is actually we celebrate the day of Pentecost. I'll tell you what that is. It shows up in the Bible. It's literally 50 days after the, um, the crucifixion. That's what Pentecost is. Or the, so, so we'll explain that next week. Come back and I'll talk to you about tongues and interpretation of tongues and clear up a lot of confusion with that. All right. Here's the third list, though, is the ministry gifts they're called sometimes they're called the role or the office gifts because these gifts are not just like um are not just gifts they're actually people that god has appointed to lead they're called the five-fold ministry gifts as well the five-fold ministry comes from ephesians 4 and it's the apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher these five roles that god has given to certain people in the church to lead govern and guide and guard the church okay these five roles let me read it to you actually so I think it's, it's important to understand within the context of how we are all gifted to serve. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we get this list. Let me show it to you, verses 11 through 13. It says, So Christ himself 
gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Notice these five leaders in the church God has equipped and given these gifts. Why? To equip his people for works of service. Okay, so, so a lot of us think that, no, no, the pastors, they're the ones who are supposed to be doing all the preaching and teaching and serving and praying and visiting and all that. And, and we are just like, I mean, we're just the ones who are supposed to be the, I don't know, spectators of this all. That's not biblical at all, at all. According to the scriptures, as a pastor, what I'm called to do is not do all the preaching, teaching, praying and visiting. I am called by God, according to the scripture, to equip you to do all the praying, preaching, serving, and visiting. I'm, I'm called to equip you to do the works of the ministry. You are the priests. Okay, this is what it's saying. That, that we're, you equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining, I love this, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. There is a, look, when we all use our gifts, we're all equipped by God to do the work he's called us to do, to be the priest he's called us to be. We are able to attain the whole measure of the, the stature of Christ, the fullness of Christ, which means that there is a whole measure, there's a half measure and little measure as well. There's a lot of Christians that are living on a half measure because you're not being equipped to be the priest God has called you to be. You're not using the gifts God has given you to use, to be the light and the priest he's called you to be. Romans chapter 12, verse six says, we have different gifts, every one of us. Your gift ain't my gift, and my gift isn't, isn't yours. We all have different gifts according to the grace that God has given us. That word grace, that Greek word there is charis. And it literally, it translates as divine enablement. You have been divinely enabled by God with a gift to serve him. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, all these gifts are the work of the one same spirit and he gives to each of them, the Holy Spirit gives to each of them just as he determines. So the Holy Spirit determines what gifts you get. They're put inside of you. He's got a plan, okay? But at the same time, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse one tells us to follow the way of love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. So we see God actually will give you gifts and he's determined to give you certain gifts and he's appointed you to have these gifts. But at the same time, he wants you to actually desire and pray for gifts of the spirit as well. Meaning this, you might not have the word of wisdom operating in your life, but you can eagerly pray, God, I need your wisdom for this problem, for this meeting. I need heaven's strategy. Holy Spirit, help me. And he can impart to you a word of wisdom. You can say, God, I need discernment. Something, I, 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 something feels off. Will you just give me discernment about this person, about this situation, about this decision? And God can drop into you discernment of spirits if you eagerly desire the gifts of the spirits. So there's three things that we need to understand, though, about spiritual gifts. And then I'm going to get really practical with you guys. Number one is this. My gifts actually reveal God's plan for my life. My gifts, what God, like our, our dream team motto here at Discovery is I was made for this. I was made for this. Your gifts reveal God's plan for your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, God has a part for you to play in the body of Christ. Some of you probably asked yourself, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing for God. What am I supposed to do for God? Ephesians 2.10 says this, we are God's masterpiece, designed and fashioned by God as a masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ so that we can do, look what it says, the good things that he planned for us long ago. God planned your life that it would produce, he would produce from your life good things. Before you were ever born, he planned for it. And he put the right gifts inside of you to do what he's called you to do. Okay? Meaning this, he didn't create you and then go, oh man, what am I going to do now? This one here, dang it. I already have someone to do that. I already got someone to do that. Ah, uh, No, he wasn't doing that. He planned for you to do the good thing, put all the gifts you needed to accomplish it, and then created you as a masterpiece. You were made intentionally. You were made by design is what that means. There's a lot of confusion and dysphoria in our culture today, isn't there? People don't know who they are. People don't know what they are, what they're supposed to be doing so much so that their mind tells them one thing about who they are, so they'll change their life or even their body to match what their mind is saying. 
How many know what I'm talking about, okay? But the Bible gives an, an absolute opposite solution to that problem. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind and then offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I give God my mind. Your gifts, your gifts will actually reveal God's plan for your life. That's why it's important for you to understand this. Number two, second thing we need to understand is that my gifts can't replace my fruit. The gifts of the Spirit cannot replace the fruit of the Spirit. And we have to be very careful that we don't become a gift-seeking church, that we cease to be a fruit-seeking church. So what does it mean to be the, the fruit of the Spirit? Jesus actually talked about the fruit of the Spirit more than he did the gifts of the Spirit. Matthew chapter 7, here's what Jesus says about the fruit. He says, watch out for false prophets. There's going to be people who, who have certain gifts, but they're not from me. They're false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves, and this is how you're going to recognize them, by their fruits, not by their gifts, not by how powerful they are, not by the display. It's by their fruit will you recognize them. What was the fruit Jesus was speaking of? Maybe in the sidebar, write a little note. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the apostle Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now here's what Jesus is saying. If someone is displaying the gifts of the Spirit but lacks the fruit, lacks self-control, lacks kindness, you're looking at someone who might be false, who might be wearing sheep's clothing, but inwardly there's something else. Okay? He goes on to say, look, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? No. Figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree can't even bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. And then he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, Jesus says, not a few, not a little bit, but many will say to me on that day, wait a second, Lord, Lord, I had a lot of gifts. I used my gifts. I did not prophesy. And you know, I cast out demons. I did miracles. There was all these manifestational things that were produced from my life. And Jesus goes, then I'm going to tell them, but I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Here's what Jesus is saying. Please hear me. It is possible to be active in the gifts of the Spirit and still go to hell. But it is impossible to bear the fruit of the Spirit and go to hell. Y'all with me today, all right? Is that too much for you? I, I say it because I love you. So, so write it down like this. We can do a lot more harm than good when we operate in the gifts of the Spirit, check this out, but we lack the character of Christ. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's the character of Christ. There has been so much damage done in Christianity, in the church, in people's lives by being a gift-centered person or church than a fruit-centered. Your gifts do not replace the fruit of the Spirit. This was actually one of the key problems or issues that the Corinthian church had, the church at Corinth. The apostle Paul planted the church at Corinth, and then there was a bunch of issues that were happening there, and he writes them two letters. One of the reasons was because of this. They got filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were all using their gifts and were active in the gifts, yet all of them were, were, were doing it for the wrong reasons and just promoting themselves with it. They, they forgot the fruit of the Spirit and were focused on the gifts of the Spirit, so much so that the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, 17, he said, in the following decrees, hey, church at Corinth, in the following directives, I have no praise to give you. Because your meetings, when you gather together, it does more harm than good. What was happening when they gathered together, they wanted to display their gifts. They wanted to give a word, and I got a word of knowledge, and I got a prophecy, and I got, I got leadership, and I got a decision I want to make, and I got, and I got, and I got, and then I got tongues over here. And everyone wanted to display their gift. Whenever this happens, when people feel like they're quenched by a 90-minute service that they can't get their gift out, it's always because you have no devotion life outside this wall. None. 
okay? Because your gift is not on display for 90 minutes. God wants to use you everywhere you're at. My gifts reveal God's plan for my life, but it doesn't replace the fruit of the Spirit. Very important. Here's the third thing we need to understand. Your gifts, my gifts, write it down, can make a difference. That's why God gave you the gifts of the Spirit. He wants to make a difference through your life. Many of you here today never realize, you never knew that you're actually a priest of God who have been anointed and given spiritual gifts to make a difference, to change the world for the cause of Christ. Those of you that do know it, you don't need me to tell you the joy that comes by being used from God, the joy that comes by being active in the assignment and the gifts that God has given you. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's because real joy doesn't come from making money. Real joy doesn't come from the things of this world. Real joy doesn't come from pleasures. Real joy comes from my life producing something for eternity that matters. That's where real joy comes from. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that people see the light inside of you and they praise your Father who's in heaven. In the scripture we read in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here's here's what's happening a lot in the world today and in Christianity today and churches today and believers today. We're living in such a dark world and some of you aren't turning on your light. You're so distracted, maybe by somebody else's light, that you're not turning on your own. In fact, can we just, can you get out your phone right now? Let's do this. Look, I'm going to go, I'm going to turn it all dark in here, and I want to, I want to, I want you to see something. Let's just go, before you turn on your light, here's what I want you to do, your flashlight. This section way over here, can y'all turn on your flashlight? Turn on your flashlight, lift it up or shine your light. Let your light so shine that it, that we see and praise God in heaven. Okay, here's what you guys have an opportunity. You guys are in dark still over there. You're in, no, I'm just kidding. You guys over here, you can look at that light over there and go, man, they look so bright. I wish I had an, that must be an iPhone 25 Max Plus or something. I don't got that. I'm still on like the, the, the 9. I don't even, and so you can, you can like, I don't got a flashlight that bright. And you can choose to keep it. You got everything that you need to shine for Jesus. You got, God has given you the gifts. He has called you to be a priest, yet you can be distracted or compare and not light up the people, not shine for Jesus and serve the people that God has put you around. Go ahead and turn on your lights. Way over here. Come on, come on. Turn them on, turn them on, turn them on. Lift up, lift up, lift up. Let your light shine before men. All over here. Will you do it? Will you just turn on your lights? Come on, this is, this is the, I've had this dream that this, we'd be this kind of church, you guys. Keep that up, keep that up. Because what would our church look like? What would our world look like if we were the priests that God has called us? If we use the light that God has given us, if we shine to the people around us and we serve the people and we proclaim the goodness of God with whatever gift he's given you, because it's all different. Over here, man, I got this vision of, there's someone like, I'm Renee and I'm a child of God. I'm a priest. I've been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. And I got the gift of administration and I serve in kids ministry and I like checking people in to, to, to kids ministry. And I'm, and I'm Mark over here, and I got the gift of leadership, and I'm a child of God, called out of darkness into God's marvelous light, and I've been gifted with the gift of leadership. And I love serving in, in small groups and opening up my home, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm Chris over here, and I got the, the gift of, of mercy, and I just love, love my group goes and serves at the, 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 the old folks' homes, and we just go and visit and pray and spend time with, and I, I feel like I was made for this. Can you imagine if every single one of us just knew it, if we just knew the gift that, that he has given us, if we shined it right where we were, it didn't need to look like that, it didn't need to look like them, but you were just shining the way that God created you. I'm telling you, we, we would, this is my dream, it's my dream that we would, because I'm Jason, I'm a child of God, I'm a priest of God, I've been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light, and I got the gift of pastor, and my, it's my joy to see and equip God's people, discovery, to discover who they are in Christ and use the gift that God has given them. Come on, can we give God some praise in this place? Come on. He has gifted you. You are gifted by God. So, so how, do we, how do we identify our spiritual gifts? Let me get practical with you now. How do we identify it then? If God has given it, 
given us spiritual gifts, what do we do? Here's the first thing you need to do. The first step is you got to discover it for yourself. You got to discover the spiritual gift. I can't tell you what it is. Nobody can tell you what it is. You got to discover it. This is actually the reason why we call Discovery Church. Discovery Church, you guys. When we first started Discovery, we always wanted to help people discover who God is, but who they are in Christ and be who God has called them to be. So from the very beginning, I've been preaching this message. I've been preaching the gifts of the Spirit, the priesthood of every believer, that you are a priest and a minister of God. And we've been helping people equip them and activate them in the gifts that God has given them. Every single believer, whether you're young or old, rich or poor, you're educated or not, you have been gifted by God. Well, where do we find that? How do we find it? You find it in Christ. In fact, there's 87% of people the studies say 87% of Christians do not know their spiritual gift. They don't know. How can you steward it if you don't know it? How can you shine it if you don't know what it is? Okay, and this is why I love my job, because you can't find your gift in college. You can't find your gift in your career. you got to find it here in Ephesians chapter 1. Look what it says. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. That's the only place that you can discover your gift. It's in Christ we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on you. Come on, somebody. Aren't you grateful for that? When you were running from God, God had his eye on you. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. So what do we do? We, we got to get close to the one who designed us. I got to get closer to the designer, to my designer. I got to get closer to God to discover who I am and what he's called me to do. Psalm 139 says it like this. For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't have dysphoria anymore. I'm not confused anymore. I know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. I, and unfortunately, a lot of people in this world, in this life, don't know that design. Here, write it down like this. Your design, though, reveals your destiny. How God created you determines what he's called you to do. What he put inside of you determines what he wants to use you for. We have this class at Discovery called Discovery Track. It's a two-part class we offer every month. If you're here today and you've never been a part of Discovery Track and you want to know more about the spiritual gifts and, and your destiny and your design, we created this class that we do every single month so you would discover this. The first one is called vision. Track one is vision. And we not only share with you the vision of the church, but God's vision for your life. You need to know that first. In order to know God's destiny, you got to know God's vision for your life. And so we help you discover that. And then the second step is track two, which is called purpose. In that class, which actually is today, happening today at 1115 and 1 o'clock. Two opportunities. It's in the counseling center You'll be given an entire booklet of all the spiritual gifts, the description of the spiritual gifts, the scriptural address for it, and you'll take a survey as well, a spiritual gift survey, to help you discover your own gifts. If you haven't done that, and you're serious about being who God has called you to be, if you're serious about being the priest that God has called you to be and shining the light he's put inside of you, everyone who hasn't attended, I'm encouraging you to attend it today, to discover the spiritual gifts that God has put inside you. Then you can do the second thing, which is you can develop it now. And I want to tell you that, and I want you to write that down, because once you start using it, I don't want you to give up when you're not good at it, okay? Because you might not be good at it when you first start in it. you got to develop the gifts, okay? You might start comparing with somebody else's light and going, oh, I'm just, I don't shine as bright as that person. No, you got to develop it. There was this parable that Jesus told called the parable of the talents. In Matthew chapter 25, you can go read it on your own, but let me just, let me kind of summarize it for you. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells this parable where three different servants were given different measures of talents. One was given five, one was given two talents, and one was given one. And by the, by the word talent, it isn't like talent or talented or gift. A talent was actually 20 years salary for an average worker. So this was a lot of that they were trusted with. So the person with five, he gives them five talents and, and, and the master goes away. But when the master comes back, the guy with five talents says, hey, I've doubled it. I've got 10 now. Here's what I, I've been a good steward with what you've given me. And the master says, come on in and to enjoy the favor of the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
The second person who actually had two talents doubled it as well. Hey, I've been a good steward of the talents you gave me. I doubled it, Lord. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in, enjoy the, the joy of the Lord with me. And then the person that was just given one, he actually buried his talent. He didn't shine the light. He didn't use the gift. He, didn't, he was not what God was called him to be and do. He just has the one. He says, here you go. I gave you the one back. And the master called this servant lazy and slothful, took the talent that he had and gave it to the guy who made 10. He said, even what you have will be given to others if you're not faithful with it. But this is what he says. He actually says that he throws this servant that buried his talents into a lake of fire where there's burning and gnashing of teeth. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't use your gift, then, oh, you're going to hell if you don't use your gift. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what Jesus, I don't think, is saying at all. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. By your fruit, you'll know them. If you are someone who does not care about the kingdom of God, the purpose of God, and being a faithful steward of what God has given you, then you are showing by your fruit, you probably don't belong to Jesus and you're a different tree. I'm your pastor and I love you, okay? I tell you this because I love you. I don't want the enemy to deceive you. Because some people, Jesus said, are gonna show up in heaven one day and be like so confused. Lord, but Lord, was stuff. I did stuff for you. No, no, it's not about the stuff. You didn't know me. You didn't know me. You got to, don't just discover it. We got to, we got to be faithful. We got to develop it. First Timothy chapter four, verse 14 says, do not neglect your gift. A lot of us are neglecting the gift that God has given us. There's a couple reasons why you're neglecting it. And actually, Paul's telling Timothy there's two different reasons. Your age or you feel inadequate. Those are two reasons why some of us are neglecting the gift of God that he's put inside of you. Your age. For Timothy, he was, he was maybe feeling like he was too young. He was younger than a lot of people. And to any young person that's in here today, feel like, I'm just too young to be used by God. No, you are not. You are gifted by God. You are called to be a priest and a light right there in your school. You can lead that group. You can pray for that person. You can be the light right there in that school that you're in, okay? You are not too young. And for those of you that are thinking, I'm too old, I'm past my time, I'm just, it's somebody else's time. As long as you are breathing, God's not done with you. You have light inside of you that you need to be shining for Jesus. Faithful steward of the time and the grace that God has given you. Some of you feel inadequate, disqualified, believe in the lies of the enemy. No, no, no. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're called out of darkness into God's marvelous light to shine. And people would see you shining in the various shine, iPhone, Android, whatever you got. You know, in the various, the various gifts. And people will see and give praise to God in heaven. Discover the gift. Develop the gift. Number three, write it down. Deploy your spiritual gift, like use it. You got you to gotta now step out and use it. You've been given a spiritual gift to benefit the body of Christ. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to make more money. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't say that, right? Right? Some of y'all, whoa. No, no. Here's, here's why I said that, because some of you have been given the gift of leadership, and your business is benefiting from it, but not the body of Christ. And so you've been given different gifts. And I'm not saying they can't benefit other areas. Shine that light wherever you are. Shine that light. God is giving you that gift to shine, but he's giving it to you not for your own personal benefit, not for your personal promotion, not for your own entitlement. He's giving you that light to serve others. As a faithful steward of God's grace in its various forms. So how do we deploy the gift? Look for a place to serve. Don't look for a platform to shine on. Look for a place to serve. That's what you do with your gift. You serve. Your spiritual gifts were not given for your personal benefit, but to serve others. So we got to discover them, develop them, and deploy them. Let me pray for you. Come on with every head bowed. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.